Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. On Patreon, I have various tiers you can choose from, which includes everything from shoutouts and episodes to swag to early episodes and more. Don't forget, I also have two other podcasts out there, Pucks and Cups and From John to Justin, available on all podcast platforms. Both of those podcasts are reaching the end of their runs, and I'm going to be launching two new ones. In May, I'm launching Canada's Great War, where I look at Canada in the First World War. And in June, I'll be launching Coast to Coast, which looks at the Transcontinental Railway and its construction. During her heyday, only Charlie Chaplin could compare to Mary Pickford when it came to worldwide fame. Beloved across the globe, she was the highest paid actress of her day, and for Americans, she was known as America's sweetheart. Of course, the irony is that she was Canadian. Today, I'm looking at one of the biggest movie stars of the silent era, Gladys Louise Smith, or Mary Pickford. Born on April 8, 1892, Mary Pickford was the oldest child of Charlotte and John Charles Smith. When she was born, Pickford was baptized as a Methodist, the religion of her father. When she was four, she contracted diphtheria and was baptized by a Roman Catholic priest, and her middle name was changed to Marie. Oh, I'm very sad about my old Toronto. Yes? Mm-hmm. You know, I used to ride down on my bicycle right from Young Street down yeah. to Queen. Yeah. And I didn't have to pedal at all. You know, there's quite a little hill there. Yes, you wouldn't notice it today. Of course, nobody ever rides a bicycle down <laughs> University Avenue. Well, I did, you know. When I went back, even after that the trees had been taken down on the bicycle path, I told the newspaper people how I love my bicycle. And um, when I was photographed in front of the house where I was born, there stood a bicycle. <laughs> Two years later, when she was six, her father, who had already abandoned the family, died from a head injury after a fall while working on a Niagara steamship. Charlotte began to rent a room to a stage manager from the coming stock company of Toronto. As it turned out, this renter would change the life of the entire family. The manager suggested to Charlotte that her daughters would be perfect for the stage. That same year, Mary would make her stage debut with the Valentine Stock Company in 1898 in Bottles Baby. In 1900, she performed at Toronto's Princess Theatre, playing the parts of a boy and a girl in The Silver King, while her mother played the organ for the production. Before long, she began to land more roles in Toronto theatres. For the next six years, the family toured with mostly third-rate companies in place, barely making enough money to get by. By this point, Pickford was 15, and she decided she would spend one more summer trying to land a leading role in Broadway, and if she failed, she would quit acting. In 1907, when she was 15, the family joined the David Belesco Theatre Company, and he suggested that Gladys start going by the name of Mary Pickford which was her middle name and the middle name of her grandfather, John Pickford Hennessy. That same year, she landed a supporting role in the Warrens of Virginia. The play was written by William DeMille, and his brother Cecil was a member of the cast. In 1909, motion pictures were just starting to take the world by storm, and seeing that this was where acting was heading, Pickford began to seek work in the new medium, and landed her first cinematic experience in Her First Biscuits, which was directed by D.W. Griffith. Well, as I entered the uh, Biograph uh, studio, and it was a, a big old mansion, with a beautiful uh, sta winding staircase, a circular staircase, marble floor, and out of the uh, opposite door, a swinging door, that led to the studio proper, which was a ballroom, came the one and only D.W. Griffith, David War Griffith. And he looked me up and down, and I resented it very much. I thought, here's one of these awful people that um, work in motion pictures. And he said to me, what do you want? I said, I'm looking for work. He said, what experience have you had? Well, this was adding insult to injury. 
I said, only 10 years. He said, you don't look that old. Well, he said, what did you do last? I said, uh, I just came from the David Belasco Company. He said, that's good enough. Come with me. So he put on my makeup, the first motion picture makeup I ever had. And I want to tell you, I looked lo- more like Poncia Villa. <laughs> she had been offered $5 per day whenever she was needed for a scene, but Pickford declined, asking for $25, stating, quote, I am an actress and an artist, and I must have a guarantee of $25 a week and extra when I work extra, end quote. While she didn't get that amount, she was given $10, double what the usual was for the time. She soon signed with the Biograph Company, and her first starring role in the violin maker Corona was also directed by Griffith. The 15-minute film was released on June 7, 1909. Of that time, Pickford would say, quote, I played scrub women and secretaries and women of all nationalities. I decided that if I could get into as many pictures as possible, I'd become known, and there would be a demand for my work. End quote. In 1909, she appeared in 51 films, although some sources say 40, and when Biograph went to California in 1910, Pickford followed the company and would continue to make short films with D.W. Griffith. With each new film, audiences and critics began to see that Pickford, who was just over 5 feet tall, dominated her scenes through the feisty character she would play. Unlike many actors at the time who treated movies in the same manner as plays, she knew how to play for the camera instead of a live theater audience. She did this by fusing realism with the gestures of silent films, which created an intimacy between herself as the actor and the audience viewing the film in the theater. Described as an acting genius and a comic spitfire, Mary Pickford soon began to grow in popularity and as films grew longer in length, her fame grew with it. Florence Lawrence would leave Biograph in 1910, and Pickford replaced her as the main female star of the company. That same year, she married Owen Moore, who acted with her in The First Misunderstanding. At the time, actors were not listed in the credits, but as people noticed Pickford, the company capitalized on this by advertising on sandwich boards calling her the girl with the golden curls, or blondie locks, or the Biograph girl. In 1911, after leaving Biograph, she would work for the Independent Moving Pictures Company, later to become Universal Pictures in 1912. During that time, she continued to work with Griffith in movies such as The Mender of Nets, Just Like a Woman, and The Female of the Species. She also made her last Biograph picture that year, The New York Hat. She would say, years later, quote, I made a film in which I was the mother of several children, the eldest of whom was five years younger than I. I played a scrub woman and secretaries and women of all nations. I noticed rather early that Mr. Griffith seemed to favor me in the roles of Mexican and Indian women. End quote. That same year, she would appear on the cover of the New York Dramatic Mirror, an honor usually only given to theater stars. Pickford would return to Broadway in 1912 to act in A Good Little Devil, Always hoping to become a Broadway star, she soon found that she deeply missed acting in films. It was this play that inspired her to work only in film. With that decision, William DeMille would say, quote, She's throwing her whole career in the ash can and burying herself in a cheap form of amusement. There will never be any real money in those galloping tin types. Say goodbye to little Mary Pickford. She'll never be heard from again. End quote. And he was wrong. Very wrong. In 1913, Pickford began to work with famous players in famous plays, which would become Paramount Pictures. She would act in a silent version of A Good Little Devil, but Pickford was unhappy with the film, stating, quote, One of the worst I ever made. It was deadly. End quote. Despite the poor showing of the film, she would act in several films from 1913 to 1914, including in The Bishop's Carriage, Caprice, and Hearts Adrift. It was the last one that made her extremely popular with the viewing public, and she would ask for a pay raise thanks to the excellent showing of the film. In her next film, Tess of the Storm Country, released five weeks after Hearts Adrift, her name was above the title, and it sent her career into overdrive. It was believed that this was the film that made her not only the most popular actress in America, but the world. What do you think was your first really great motion picture? 
Well, let me see. Do you mean in the very, very old days? Yes, the one which I think would establish you as America's sweetheart. <laughs> You're very nice. You know, I've never ex accepted that title. <laughs> <laughs> it's too complimentary. I've never thought that. But I, 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 I do appreciate it. Well, I would say that Tess of the Storm Country. Now that was, uh, wasn't that about the beginning of the First World War? Before. Before then? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm getting to the age now where I'm very proud of the stripes on my arm. <laughs> <laughs> Service stripes. <laughs> yes. By 1916, only Charlie Chaplin surpassed Pickford in popularity. Both Chaplin and Pickford enjoyed fame far beyond anything the other actors in Hollywood enjoyed. From the mid-1910s to the 1920s, Pickford was believed to be the most famous woman in the world. One silent film journalist would say she was, quote, the best-known woman who has ever lived, the woman who is known to more people and loved by more people than any other woman that has ever been in all of history, end quote. On June 24, 1916, Pickford signed a contract that paid her $10,000 per week or $213,000 today. This new contract, signed with Zucor, would give her full authority on the production of the films in which she was starring. She was also entitled to half of a film's profits, with a guarantee of $1,040 or $22,000 today. According to legend, Pickford's mother, Charlotte, had overheard a Zucor salesman saying that as long as they had Pickford, they could make the exhibitors take everything. With that knowledge, Pickford was able to negotiate that incredible contract. Having full control of the production was important for Pickford, and she would say, quote, So many things can ruin a fine work, end quote. Adolf Zukor would say years later, quote, Larry Pickford is the best businessman in Hollywood, end quote. That decision did not come without cost. Her friend, Griffith, was outraged and said that he made Mary Pickford, and she would soon vanish. He also said that he would make actress Mae Marsh bigger than Pickford. One rumored tale of why she quit with Griffith was that he asked her to flash her legs in a caveman costume during a film. Knowing that her public saw her as innocent and even as a child, she refused. For most of her career, Pickford dictated her career rather than allowing others to do so. Often, Pickford would play the role of a child, but it was not incredibly common. For Pickford, because she never had a normal childhood, she enjoyed playing that role. Pickford was so good in these roles as a child, helped by her height of five feet, that when Douglas Fairbanks Jr. met her, he assumed that she was a boy and a new playmate for him. Typically, her films had Pickford in the role of an orphan looking for a paternal figure, which would often end up becoming a romantic figure. She was often poor or working class, with her characters allowing Mary to draw upon her past. During the First World War, she often campaigned for the war effort, including selling one of her trademark curls for $15,000. Ironically, many of the curls were not real, and often the hair was bought from prostitutes and other people who needed money. It was then built into hair pieces for her ringlets. Each curl cost $50, a huge amount at the time, and Pickford traveled with a suitcase full of curls. Pickford was also seeing that people would act strange around her, People would often steal the flowers from her hat. If she was barefoot in a film, some people would become quite angry with her. Once, after a manicure, the child saw her in public and said, quote, Mama, she's not a real little girl. She has long fingernails. End quote. From this point, she clipped her nails short and banned herself from fiddling with lipsticks and pencils in public so that people didn't think that she smoked. Sometimes women would come up to her asking for thousands of dollars, and telling her that it would be her fault if they would have to sell their bodies to make money. One time, a man stared at her for a full two minutes and then said, quote, You may have the face of an angel and the heart of a devil. If you have, I pity you. If you haven't, I pray for you. End quote. Despite this, many loved her and the movies she was in. And while she was Canadian, many saw her as a symbol of America, and she would often kiss the American flag for cameras. In one speech in Chicago, it was estimated she raised $5 million worth of bonds. The U.S. Navy began to call her the official little sister of the Navy, and the Army named two cannons after her and made her an honorary colonel. Some soldiers even took her picture in lockets when they went off to war. In August of 1910, her contract expired, 
and she decided not to renew it. Zucor offered her $250,000 to never make movies again, preferring not to have her as competition with another company. That amount would be $5.3 million today. Instead, Pickford went over to First National Pictures. In 1919, along with Charlie Chaplin, Griffith, and Douglas Fairbanks, she formed United Artists. Through this new company, she could produce and perform in her own movies and distribute them in a way she liked. In 1920, she would release Pollyanna, which grossed $1.1 million, followed by Little Lord Fauntleroy in 1921 and Rosita in 1923, all of which grossed over $1 million. At the dawn of the 1920s, Pickford divorced Moore on the grounds of desertion. Moore was an alcoholic and, as an actor in his own right, he was insecure about her level of fame. There were rumors of domestic violence as well, and the couple had not been living together for some time. One time, according to Pickford, when she came down in a new dress, he yelled in front of several guests, quote, You look like something on top of a birthday cake, end quote. Another time, he would tell friends at a party, quote, Mary has an expressive little talent, hardly what I'd call cerebral, end quote. She was forced to pay him $100,000 as part of the agreement for the divorce settlement. Days later, she married Douglas Fairbanks. Two years previous, Pickford had begun a relationship with Douglas Fairbanks when they toured together to promote Liberty Bond sales for the war effort. The couple were worried about a public backlash relating to their marriage, since they were both divorced and had been seeing each other while they were both married to others. But instead, they were treated like royalty by fans. Pickford would say, quote, America's sweetheart, I want to be one man's sweetheart, end quote. Upon her marriage to Fairbanks, she became an American citizen, and they would move into a mansion in Beverly Hills that they called Pickfair. At the time, they were the most glamorous couple in Hollywood. When they went on a trip to Europe for their honeymoon, they were mobbed by fans. They would leave New York on June 12, 1910 on a Red Star cruise liner, and when they arrived in London, the New York Times reported, quote, Arriving in London, the pair were mobbed to such an extent that they had to spend one weekend at Lord Northcliffe's place and another one at the country seats of the Duke of Sutherland. End quote. Fairbanks then hired an Italian driver to chauffeur them throughout Europe. They would visit the ex Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany and were honored with a dinner in Paris that was attended by 200 of the country's most prominent actors. The marriage was called the Marriage of the Century and they were referred to as the King and Queen of Hollywood. The fame of the couple was such that when foreign heads of state came to see the president at the White House, they would often ask if they could go to Pickfair to meet the couple. At Pickfair, the couple would host Charlie Chaplin, the best friend of Fairbanks, as well as Albert Einstein, Helen Keller, H.G. Wells, Amelia Earhart, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Babe Ruth, and many others. Will Rogers would say that his biggest job as the mayor of Beverly Hills was to direct tourists to Mary Pickford's house. In 1921, Pickford would co-found and serve as the first vice president of the Motion Picture Relief Fund, which provided financial assistance to employees in the film industry in need. Pickford was not someone who enjoyed traveling, but she did so to find inspiration for her movies. She would travel with Fairbanks in 1926 to Berlin, and upon watching a movie by Sergei Eisenstein that brought her to tears, she would say, quote, How my hand had frozen to the umbrella I was holding and how I had to pry it away with the other hand when the picture was over, end quote. She would then become the first Hollywood producer to bring an established European director over to the United States when she brought Sergei over. Throughout her career, she was highly charitable, helping friends, family, and others who needed money. On every set she worked at, she hung a bucket, and asked everyone working to put money into the bucket to help others in the industry who had no work. In 1927, along with Douglas Fairbanks, she became the first star to make an imprint of her hands and feet in the cement outside the Chinese theater. She also became one of the 36 founders of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, now known as the Academy Awards. But times began to change that year when The Jazz Singer was released, the first talking picture. Pickford would star in her last silent movie, My Best Girl, the same year, and like many silent movie stars, she was dismissive of talking films at first, stating, quote, Adding sound to movies would be like putting lipstick on the Venus de Milo. End quote. 
1928, Pickford lost her mother to cancer. With this loss and the changing movie industry, it was a difficult time for Pickford, and she would star in Coquette in 1929, her first talkie, and she received the Academy Award for Best Actress. This made her the first Canadian to win an Academy Award. Miss Bazant, I believe you were in love with Michael Jeffrey, were you not? No. You weren't? No. Then why did you tell him after he was shot that you loved him more than life itself? He was dying. I pitied him. You, you were very tender to him. He was dying. You kissed him. He was dying. I tell you. You cried as though your heart were broken. I, I cried once when my doll was broken. He spoke of a little house in the valley. He, he was delirious. Hadn't he gone up into the hills to work diligently in order that he might buy that little house for you? No. Then why did he go up into the hills? Because, because he was, he was angry, I reckon. Angry? Why? Because he, he couldn't have me then. Why, he carried your picture. He cherished it. He, he probably had pictures of lots of girls. <laughs> the movie caused a stir because she had cut her trademark ringlets and instead had a bob haircut, something she had actually done in the wake of her mother's death. For many, the transformation was a shock as her hair had become a symbol of female virtue for some. The cutting of her hair made front-page news with the New York Times, and some people even resorted to sending her hate mail. She also starred in The Taming of the Shrew that year with Douglas Fairbanks, and the film failed at the box office, a sign of things to come. In 1933, Pickford would make her final film appearance when she acted in Secrets. Due to the closure of the banks as a measure to fight the Great Depression, it did poorly at the box office. Soon after, Pickford retired from acting in films for good. She would say, quote, I left the screen. The little girl made me. I wasn't waiting for the little girl to kill me. End quote. She would appear on stage in Chicago in 1934 in The Church Mouse and went on tour in 1935. She also did radio plays for NBC and CBS in 1935 and 1936. And while not acting, she produced films throughout the 1940s, including One Rainy Afternoon and Love Happy with the Marx Brothers. Pickford was highly skilled when it came to business, and she would oversee everything related to the films released by her. In 1934, she wrote The Demi Widow, as well as Why Not Try God, a pamphlet promoting Christian science. She returned to Canada in May of 1934, going back to Toronto, where she was given an official civic reception, and huge crowds jammed the streets of the city to see her. She was also given a Gold Centennial Medal, and in her speech she would say, quote, I am proud to be Canadian, end quote. In 1936, Pickford would separate from Douglas Fairbanks, citing infidelity. Despite the divorce, Douglas Fairbanks' son stated that Pickford and his father long regretted their inability to reconcile. Fairbanks would die only three years later. In 1937, Pickford married Buddy Rogers and adopted his two children, Charles and Roxanne. While she no longer acted in films, Pickford would keep busy through business. She would set up the Mary Pickford Cosmetics, she co-founded the Society of Independent Motion Picture Producers and the Mary Pickford Charitable Trust. In 1943, her family home was demolished in Toronto and most of the bricks were delivered to Pickford in California. The proceeds from the sale were donated by Pickford to build a bungalow in Toronto and the bungalow was then made the first prize in a lottery to benefit war charities. On May 26, 1943, she unveiled the home. Pickford and Chaplin remained partners and United Artists for decades until 1955, when Chaplin left the company. Pickford left the company one year later, selling her shares for $3 million or $30 million today. Thanks to her prudence during her heyday, she would often put upwards of two-thirds of her income away in the bank, rather than spend it. And by the time she was long past acting, her net worth was estimated to be $40 million or upwards of $200 million today. She also owned many of her early silent films, and her intention was to have them burned upon her death. 
Thankfully, in 1970, she agreed to donate 50 of her biograph films to the American Film Institute. Sadly, as she aged, she became more of a recluse and she would struggle with both alcoholism and depression. She rarely made public appearances except in 1953, when she took part in the first televised broadcast of the Academy Awards. As a recluse, she only saw Lillian Gish, a fellow actress, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., and a few other people. She would say around this time, quote, It would be unfair to the woman I was. Why should I try to compete with the beauties of today? End quote. In 1955, she would publish her memoirs, Sunshine and Shadows. In 1959, she had to appear in court on a matter relating to her co-ownership of a North Carolina TV station. The court date was actually her 67th birthday, and when asked under oath to give her age, she said, quote, I'm 21 going on 20, end quote. By the mid-1960s, Pickford would only receive visitors by phone, speaking to them from her bedroom. Her husband would give tours of Pickfair, which included a western bar she had bought for Douglas Fairbanks and a portrait of Pickford that is now in the Library of Congress. She would also hold charitable events at her home, including a Christmas party held every year to help blind veterans from the First World War. When she received a Lifetime Achievement Oscar in 1976, she did not attend the ceremony and only accepted it at Pickfair. Mary, hmm? I present this to you with great pride and with the love and admiration of the whole Academy. That's wonderful. You made me very, very happy. And thank you. Well, it's nice to see another, isn't it? It, it certainly is. He hasn't changed very much in all this time, has he? Well, I hope not. No, he hasn't. <laughs> he hasn't. There have been a lot of him made. And a lot of marvelous actors and actresses have won him. And it, it, it's only proper that finally he's come back to you again. Well, it's very nice to be able to thank them all, and especially you. Thank you. And you, for all you've contributed to this great industry of ours. I shall treasure always. Late in her life, Pickford believed that she was no longer a British subject, as she was at her birth, because she married Fairbanks in 1920. When Canadian citizenship was created in 1947, she never acquired it as a result. She did have a passport, which was a British-Canadian passport, as well as owning a home in Toronto. As she approached her last year, she stated she wanted to die as a Canadian, and she was able to reclaim her Canadian citizenship. Canadian authorities were not sure if she ever even lost her citizenship since she had a Canadian passport, but her request was approved, and Pickford became an official Canadian citizen. On May 29, 1979, she would die in Santa Monica, California, and she's buried at Forest Lawn Memorial Park. During her life and after, Pickford was heavily honored throughout North America. She has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and the Mary Pickford Theater at the James Madison Memorial Building of the Library of Congress is named for her. Several movie theaters were named for her as well. A bust and historic plaque marks her birthplace in Toronto, and Pickford was inducted into Canada's Walk of Fame in 1999, and a postage stamp featured her face in 2006. On April 8, 2017, a Google Doodle was created to celebrate her 125th birthday. Over the course of her life, Pickford acted in roughly 200 short and feature films, she won two Academy Awards, and as of 2009, two of her films have been added to the National Film Registry. I'll close out this episode with a quote from her friend D.W. Griffith, who said, quote, She has tremendous driving power in her, and a most remarkable talent for self-appraisal. She never kids herself. The thing that most attracted me the day I first saw her was the intelligence that shone in her face. I found she was thirsty for work and information. She could not be driven from the studio while work was going on. She was, and is, a sponge for experience. End quote. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at Mary Pickford. And if you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can reach me through email at craig at 
You can also visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to CanadaEHX.com. And don't forget you can support the podcast through Patreon. There are multiple tiers to choose from, all with great benefits. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just like all of these wonderful patrons have, and I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Doug Campbell, Reg W, Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Randall McCallum, Diane Wade, Lori Ann Kirby, Gary Dolovich, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S, JP Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. If you want, you can find me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash Canadian History X. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And you can find me on Instagram. Just go to Bairdo37. Information comes from Canadian Encyclopedia, Ontario Heritage Trust, Wikipedia, JSTOR Daily, The Guardian, Women Film Pioneers Project, The Mary Pickford Organization, National Public Radio, CBC, Mental Floss, and History.com. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.